Welcome back. In lesson two, we're going to have a deep dive into the virtual machine hardware. We'll look at the files that make up a virtual machine. After all, all a virtual machine is, is a set of files. Think of them like Microsoft Word doc files is to Word. Well, we've got a set of files to a virtual machine. We'll also look at the different features of virtual machine hardware and try to make some good decisions about what version of a virtual machine hardware you actually should build your virtual machine on. Think of it as a virtual motherboard and what version of that virtual motherboard would you like to use as you're building your virtual machine. Then we'll look at all the different components of a VM. Show me all the list of all the virtual hardware and all the different options that we have there as well. We'll look at the virtual machine itself as is seen by the vSphere client. Okay. We'll look at different ways to, to access that virtual machine through the different console options that we have. Then we'll have a look at a few things relative to the virtual network adapters, especially having a look at VMXNet 3, which is VMware's customized virtual network adapter that is designed to be really efficient in our virtualized environment. And then we'll have a look at virtual disks. What does it mean to have a thick provision disk versus a thin provision disk? Well, let's dive right in. Starting with the virtual machine files, we need to understand that virtual machines are encapsulated into a set of files. And every single virtual machine, by default, is, is placed in a specific folder. That folder is named for the name of the VM. So when I build a virtual machine, I give it a name. Call it, for example, VM1. Okay? On a data store, which, like I said before, is just a, a storage uh, area for virtual machine files, I'm going to have a folder then called VM1. And all of the files within that folder, well, not all of them, but most of them, will have vm something. Right? We're going to show you in the next slide all of the different types of files that make up your virtual machine. Okay? Now, these files can be stored on VMFS data stores, which is a proprietary system built by VMware for VMware with virtual machine files in mind. We can use the standard NFS file shares. We can use vSAN or virtual volumes data stores. Lots of different types of data stores. And in module six, we're actually going to cover all of these different types of data stores and look at how they're created and how they're managed and really what the difference is between them. In the end, they're just one nice, happy place that all of my ESXi hosts can access a piece of storage where we'll find our virtual machines. And an ESXi host then can power those VMs on and run them. Now, when we create a virtual machine, there are a few files that are created within that folder, once again named for the VM itself. And all of those files take the prefix of the name of the virtual machine. So if I create a virtual machine called VM1, then I'm going to have vm1.vmx and vm1.vswp and vmx-vm1.vswp, and so on. So let's take a look at what some of these files actually are and what they do. The first file, and perhaps the most important file for a virtual machine, is the VMX file. Now, a VMX file is actually a plain text file. So if you wanted to open it, you could read it. And it describes the virtual machine itself. It gives you the name of the VM. It says how much CPU and how much RAM your virtual machine is provisioned for. It gives you uh, a listing for each of the virtual network adapters and what is the MAC address of that virtual network adapter. It describes the virtual hard disk and points you to the virtual hard disk files, that is, the VMDK files. It can also have all kinds of other settings for the VM. Uh, which storage controller? Is there a CD-ROM? Is there an ISO image attached to the CD-ROM? And those sorts of things. So if somebody were to give you a listing of all the files in a virtual machine's directory and say, hey, which of those is actually the virtual machine itself, you can point to this VMX file. Now, when we power a virtual machine on, in order to support an ESXi host that might be out of RAM, we have a swap mechanism. Every virtual machine, when you power it on, gets a VSWP file. 
And the size of that VSWP file is going to be equal to the size of the memory allocation that you have granted to that virtual machine. So if I give a, re a VM eight gigs of RAM, the VSWP file will be eight gigs. There are a couple of exceptions to that. And we'll explain those a little bit later. Now, in order to support ESXi's overhead for that virtual machine, we also have a VMX swap file, right? That file is much smaller, and the size of that file will depend on how much memory and how much CPU you've allocated to the VM. The more resources the VM is granted, the larger ESXi's overhead might be in certain situations, and so the more amount, uh, the larger the VMX VSWP file will be. We also have a BIOS file in the form of an NVRAM file. Now this is a binary file and it changes a little bit depending on whether or not you've got a firmware BIOS or you've got an EFI based BIOS, okay? But this is a file that you wouldn't touch or modify or anything like that. Now when you power on a virtual machine, a log file is created and it's called VMware.log. Okay. regardless of the name of the VM. This is the one exception to, hey, all of these files have the prefix of the VM, right? Not this one, okay? So this log file is only there for troubleshooting the power on of that VM. Can ESXi load the VM? Can it attach to all of the virtual disks? Does it properly get powered on and so on, right? That's what that log file is. Every time there's a new power cycle, that VMware.log file is the current log of the power. Old files are incremented with a number. So the second time you power on a VM, the current log file will be VMware.log, and the previous log file will be called VMware1.log. And then we'll create VMware2.log and so on, and three and four, and it'll just continue to increment there. Now, if instead of a virtual machine, you are working with a template, okay, we will have a VMTX file. So sometimes I've been asked the question, well, what's really the difference between a virtual machine and a template? And I'll say, honestly, it's the letter T. What happens when we take a, a virtual machine and we convert it to a template is that the VMX file is renamed to VMTX vCenter gets a little log entry in its database to say, hey, this is a template now, and we get a different little icon in our vSphere client. Otherwise, it's the exact same file, but it does mean that we can now deploy virtual machines from this template, having utilized all of the same files, including the file that comes next, which, is, which are its virtual disks. Now, virtual disks are actually made up of two files. We have a VMDK file, which is just a descriptor of the virtual disks. How many heads and cylinders and sectors might this virtual disk be? Oh, and by the way, it points you to the file that contains the actual data of the virtual disk. That file is the flat file, the VM, uh, the virtual machine dash flat dot VMDK file. And that's where actually all the data is stored. In a thick provision disk, when where all the bytes are pre-allocated or all the blocks are pre-allocated, the size of that disk data file is equal to the size of the virtual disk and its allocation when you create it. So if I build a 100 gig virtual disk, that flat VMDK file is going to be 100 gigs in size even if you haven't put any data into it yet. Even if I haven't installed an operating system, it'll just be 100 gigs in size. The last file that we want to mention here is a suspend state file. That is, if I hit the pause button on a virtual machine, it takes the contents of the memory that's running in ESXi and dumps that off to a suspend state file. The VM is then powered off when I want to resume that virtual machine where I've left off, where I had previously left off, I hit the play button, power it back on, it loads the memory state from the VMSS file, and the virtual machine continues where it left off. Now there are other files as well, things like snapshot files, but we'll get into those files when we hit the lesson on snapshots later on in module seven.
when we come back, we'll have a deeper dive into all of the options that we have as we're creating our virtual machine and choosing its virtual hardware components.